In this module, we're going to discuss the classical theory of metals. And in particular, look at where the classical theory correctly describes the properties of metals and where it breaks down to motivate an extension to the use of quantum mechanics. So let's start by reviewing the assumptions that go into the classical theory of metals that probably you learned as the Druda model or maybe the classical free electron theory of metals. So the assumptions are first that the electrons are classical particles. They're particles, they're point charges, and they're described by the laws of classical mechanics. The second is that they're removed from their parent ion, so they're ionized from either the ions or the, or the nuclei. They don't interact with each other. They're non-interacting or what we call free electrons. And that their only interaction with the ion cores is that they bounce off them. Now, if you stop and think about this for a moment, this is a really remarkable set of assumptions. Not just that we're assuming that electrons are classical, which we know now, of course, it's not correct, but also that they're not interacting there. We know that they're negatively charged particles and they should interact with each other by a Coulomb interaction. But in the Druda model, we assume that they don't. And so we might ask ourselves, does this model get anything right? And of course it does, it was a very successful model for very many years before um, the advent of quantum mechanics. So we're going to work through um, a couple of examples of physical properties, some of which the Druda model is able to predict and reproduce and some of which it's not. Again, with the um, thought that when we see where the Druda model breaks down, this will motivate our extension of our theory to um, quantum mechanics later. So the first property that we're going to discuss and apply the Druda model to is Ohm's law, so just electrical conductivity. And I'm going to write Ohm's law slightly differently from the usual V is equal to IR. I'm going to write it instead as the current density is equal to the conductivity times the electric field. That's not yet Ohm's law, it's Ohm's law when the conductivity is independent of the electric field. So the current density is linear in the electric field. And we want to know, is this predicted by the Druda model? So we're going to use two pieces of physics that you're very familiar with. First from thermodynamics. We know that an ideal gas has an average kinetic energy equal to Boltzmann's constant Kb times the temperature over two per degree of freedom. 
And so in three dimensions, we can write down that the velocity associated with this kinetic energy, which we call the thermal velocity, is just the square root of three for the number of dimensions times kb times t over the mass, in this case, the mass of the electron. And if we plug in the numbers for the constants and at 300 Kelvin, we obtain a value of around 10 to the five meters per second at 300 Kelvin. And this thermal velocity is the velocity that the electrons are just whizzing around within the solid before they bounce off the ion cores. So this doesn't contribute to the conductivity. But we'll see that we need to use this value in order to verify the independence of the conductivity on the electric field later. Okay, so that's the first piece of basic physics that we're going to use to connect Druder, the Druder assumptions with Ohm's law. The second is from basic Newtonian mechanics and electrostatics. From Newton's laws, we know that the force on an electron is equal to its mass times its acceleration. And from electric, electrostatics, we know that's equal to its charge minus E times the electric field. The minus sign here is indicating that the electron is negatively charged. So we see that the electron is accelerated by an electric field and its acceleration is given by minus its charge times the size of the electric field divided by its mass. So if the electron was just in a vacuum, then it would have a constant acceleration if the constant field were applied. Of course, the electrons in the metals are, are not in a vacuum and we already said that one of the assumptions of the Druder model is that these electrons are bouncing off the ion cores. And so if we write the average time between the collisions as some time constant tau, then we can write down an average drift velocity, an average velocity at which the electrons are being accelerated in the direction of the electric field, as the acceleration multiplied by the time that they have to accelerate before they collide. And this is equal to minus E times tau of the mass times the electric field. If we know how fast the electrons are drifting in the direction of the field, then we can write down trivially the current density is equal to minus the charge on the electron times the density of the electrons times the speed at which they're drifting and substituting in what we've just derived. This is E squared times the density of electrons times the time between collisions divided by the mass multiplied by the electric field. And so we can see that Ohm's law is satisfied if our proportionality factor between the current density in the electric field is a constant, is independent of field. So it's satisfied if E M, tau, and n sub e are independent. Of the electric field. Okay, so are they? Well, 
of course, the charge on the electron and the mass of the electron are universal constants. These are independent of the electric field. The number of electrons per unit volume is usually independent of the electric field unless the electric field is so high that it further ionizes the electrons. And so the only one we have to consider then is, is tau. So is tau independent of the electric field? Is the scattering time the time between when the electrons are whizzing around in the solid and they scatter off the ions, it is independent of the electric field. And it is if the thermal velocity is considerably greater than the drift velocity. Because in this limit, the rate of collisions between the electrons and the ions is not affected by the drifting. Which the electric field induces. We said already that the thermal velocity is of the order of 10 to the 5 meters per second. At room temperature. It turns out that drift velocities, typical drift velocities, are around 10 to the minus 3 meters per second at room temperature. And so it's certainly the case that the drift velocity is very much less than the thermal velocity. It's eight orders of magnitude. And so we can say that the classical theory of metals, the classical free electron theory, the Druda model, predicts Ohm's law. And again, this is a little bit amazing. And we should ask ourselves, how have we done so well? Remember that we've assumed that electrons are classical particles. obeying f is equal to ma and from newton's laws and f is equal to minus your electronic charge times the electric field from electrostatics we've assumed that they're charged with charge minus e but they don't feel a coulomb interaction with each other And we assume that they don't collapse into the positively charged ions. But rather they just scatter off them. And we'll see later actually that um, quantum mechanics will provide us with an explanation of why these assumptions actually do rather well in the case of free electron type metals. Okay, so we got Ohm's law, but we can only go so far with our classical model. And what we'll see is that we can't explain, well, of course, non-ohmic behavior. We've shown that Ohm's law predicts ohmic behavior. But I want to look next at 
two examples where the Druder model often breaks down. One is the Hall effect, where even in some rather good free electron-like ohmic metals, the Hall effect, the predictions of the Druder model for the Hall effect are incorrect. And the second is thermal properties. And we look particularly at the case of the heat capacity and find that the Druder model does not correctly predict the heat capacity. Okay, so let's start with the Hall effect. And I'm going to start by just reviewing the basics of the Hall effect. So if you remember all about the Hall effect, you can skip ahead about 10 minutes or so. If you don't remember the details of the experiment, let's quickly go through it. So in a Hall effect measurement, we have a bar of a metallic system. And let me give you some axes so that we can be clear about what we're talking about later. So we'll make the z direction be vertical and x, y, and z like that. And I'm going to talk through this kind of in a whole experiment, in a thought experiment, of course, in practice, all of these properties happen, at the, all these things are happening at the same time. So the first thing that's happening in our metallic system is that there's a current density flowing through it, J, and we'll put J along the X direction. So the current density, J flows along the X direction. And remember this corresponds to drift velocity V sub D in the opposite direction for the, elect the case of electrons. So our electrons are flowing along minus X like this. Then in our thought experiment, the second thing that we do is apply a perpendicular magnetic field. And we'll apply our magnetic field along the Z direction. This magnetic field causes a force The Lorentz force equal to the charge times V cross B on the electrons. And this force pushes the electrons to the edge of the sample. Now remember, in this case, our drift velocity is along minus x. Our electrons are negatively charged. Q is equal to minus size of the electronic charge. And so the force is in the direction that pushes the electrons to the back of the sample. So it's along minus y in this case. So our electrons are pushed back here. And they leave an absence of electrons, which we write as positive charges along the front. This displacement of the electrons, this buildup of electrons at the back of the sample, creates a transverse electric field. E sub H. And in this case, 
the transverse electric field course points from positive to negative so it's along minus y and this electric field creates a transverse force q times e sub h that balances the magnetic force so we reach a steady state Okay, so that's the, the setup. We then define the Hall coefficient which we call R sub H to be the electric field in this geometry, the electric field along the Y direction divided by the current density along the length the x direction times the magnetic field along the z direction. And we can see that for electrons, R sub h is negative for electrons which are negatively charged. I'm not going to work through this. You can practice this yourselves, but if one made exactly the same thought experiment, but with positively charged carriers, we would find that we'd get the opposite sign for the Hall coefficient. The Hall field E sub H would be pointing in the opposite direction for the same direction of current density and magnetic field. All of these quantities, the electric field, the current density and the magnetic field can be measured so we can directly measure the Hall coefficient. This is something we can extract from the experiment. We can also predict it from the Druder model if we use the fact that the electric field on the electrons is equal to the, the force from the electric field on the electrons is equal to the force from the magnetic field at equilibrium. And using the fact that the current density is equal to the charge times the number of electrons per unit volume times the drift velocity, we can write down a theoretical Hall coefficient which is one divided by the density of the electrons times their charge. And so we can predict if we know that the, the atomic structure and the density of the atoms and how many electrons we have, we have per atom, we can predict a value for the whole coefficient and compare that with the experiment. Okay, so let's actually look at some numbers, some calculated and measured Hall coefficients. So we're going to compare the calculated value from the Druder theory, which is just one over the density of the electrons per unit volume times their charge with the measured value which is the whole field in the y direction divided by the current density in the x direction times the magnetic field in the z direction. And let's look first at lithium, which is a good ohmic free electron type metal. Knowing the number of atoms per unit volume, 
allows us to extract the number of electrons per unit volume. And assuming the electrons have the charge minus E, we get minus 1.4 times 10 to the minus 10 meters cubed per coulomb. And the value that we measure is not so far off, minus 1.7 times 10 to the minus 10 meters cubed per coulomb. So for lithium, we have rather a good agreement between classical free electron theory and the measured Hall coefficient. For zinc, the electron density is a little bit lower, so the calculated value, the predicted value, is minus 0 0.5 times 10 to the minus 10 meters cubed per coulomb. But the measured value in this case is a complete catastrophe for the classical theory. It's actually positive. So this measurement is telling us that if we assume this classical picture, that the carriers that are conducting the current are behaving as though they have a positive charge. When an electric field is applied, these carriers are accelerated in the direction of the electric field. So this is a problem. The classical free electron theory, obviously. And a really strong motivation um, for the extension to quantum mechanics. Actually, we'll see when we do quantum mechanical free electron theory, it actually also doesn't fix this problem. And we're going to have to allow the electrons to explicitly interact with the ions in order to explain positive Hall coefficients. One more quick example before we, before we stop, and that's from thermal properties. And in particular, we'll look at the electronic contribution to the heat capacity. So again, in the Druda model, each of the free electrons, each of the electrons that's ionized from, from the nucleus has an average kinetic energy equal to three kBT over two in three dimensions. And so if we have N sub E of these free electrons per unit volume, then the electronic contribution to the heat capacity which we call C electronic. The definition is that it's the derivative of the energy with respect to temperature. The energy is 3 kBT over 2 times n sub e times the number of electrons per unit volume and so it's three times the Boltzmann constant times number of electrons per unit volume divided by two and again this is something we can trivially calculate once we know the number of electrons per unit volume when we do that for many materials what we find is that experimental heat capacities for metallic systems, Ohm's law type systems that we might expect to be um, to behave reasonably are actually around 100 times smaller. So again, another complete breakdown of classical free electron theory. So we'll stop there and I hope you're feeling very motivated that we really need quantum mechanics, we need to extend 
or classical model. And um, we would replace it by a quantum mechanical picture in order to properly describe the conduction and thermal properties of metals. 